these next two kings that, that we're going to talk about in our text today are again on the uh, side of the north, so the northern ten kingdoms. And these are uh, the ones that follow ba uh, Baasha. But all of this is still going to be in the life of Asa. So remember, he, Asa reigns, oh man, he reigns for uh, like 41 years. And the whole time ba Baasha is alive, they're at war. And then these other kings are going to come up after him, which we're going to talk about. <laughs> okay, so let's go ahead and read 1 Kings 16. We'll just read uh, the first 16. I'll read to you first 16 verses. Go ahead and stand, stretch your legs out for a minute. Chapter 16, and then I'll read the first 16 verses. 1 Kings 16. Then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, uh, against Baasha, saying, for as much as I exalted thee out of the dust and made thee prince over my people Israel, and thou hast walked in the way of Jeroboam and hast made uh, my people Israel to sin to provoke me to anger with their sins, behold, I will take away the posterity of Baasha uh, the, and the posterity of his house and will make thy house like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nabat. Him that dieth of Baasha in the city shall the dogs eat, and him that dieth of, uh, of his in the field shall the fowls of the air eat. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha and what he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And I mentioned this last week because uh, this was a punishment upon him uh, because of the sins of, uh, anyway, I'll, 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 I'll lay all that out here in a minute. Uh, but we talked about that. Now, the things that he's going through are the same things that Jeroboam went through. And uh, the punishment's all, almost going to be identical. That's what he said right there. Okay, so let's go to verse 6. So Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried in Tirzah. And Elah, his son, reigned in his stead. Let me go ahead and write that up. Elah. Elah, his son, reigned in his Oh, right. Okay. And uh, he reigned instead, and also by the hand of the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanina, Hanina, came the word of the Lord against Baasha and against his house, even for all the evil that he did in the sight of the Lord, and provoking him to anger with the work of his hands, and being like the house of Jeroboam, uh, and because he killed him. If you remember, Baasha put Jeroboam and all his people to death. That's something kings often did. But God said, I'm going to judge him for that as well. In the 20, 20 and 6th year of Asa, king of Judah, he's a, he's a king on the southern side, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Tizra. Look at his long reign. Two years. Okay, but Zimri is going to be even less than that. And his servant Zimri, captain of half of his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of the house of Tirzah. And Zimri went in and smote him and killed him in the 20 and 7th year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned in his stead. So Zimri, was the last one, then next week I'll have to uh, redo this so we, we can fit on this. That's hard to write from that angle. <laughs> Probably looks terrible. <laughs> it's not writing anything upside down. Looks kind of like a child wrote it. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, where was I? Verse 10. Uh, verse 11. And it came to pass, when he began to reign, as soon as he sat on his throne, that he slew all the house of Baasha. He left him not one that pisseth against, the, against a wall, neither of his kinsfolk, nor of his friends. Uh, so at least he killed the men. We see that from the text. Thus did Zimri destroy all the house of Baasha according to the word of the Lord, which he spake against Baasha by Jehu the prophet. For all the sins of Baasha and 
the sins of Elah, his son, by which they sinned, and by which they made Israel to sin, and provoking the Lord God of Israel to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? In the twenty and seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, did Zimri reign seven days in Terzah, and the people were encamped about, uh, uh, against Gib Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. And the people that w were encamped heard say, Zimri hath conspired and hath also slain the king. Wherefore all Israel made Omri the king of the host, king over Israel that day in the camp. Lord, bless the reading of the word. And thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. And so here we see uh, two very short reigns of these kings on the northern side. Asa still alive during all of this, okay, on the on the southern side of Judah. And those are the two kings that uh, we're discussing today, but mainly what I want to discuss based on the story that we're reading is if you haven't noticed yet, the th same events seem to keep repeating themselves over and over. And also in our series on the life of Moses, don't you notice that the same things keep repeating themselves over and over? And really, uh, we could look at the whole Bible and see all the things happening again and again and again. Not only that, we could go through our history as, you, as the United States or just world history, and we could see a repetition of things that just happen over and over and over and over. And there's a saying that says, history repeats itself, or uh, I like the way... Mark Twain supposedly said it. That's who gets credit for it. And apparently he said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it sure rhymes a lot. <laughs> okay, so it might not literally repeat itself, but boy, it's sure very similar things happen in, uh, in our life. Now, interestingly enough, and I mentioned this last week, but uh, this was kind of the conclusion, <laughs> Jeroboam... If you remember, he got his king, he, he, he began to reign as a punishment for Solomon, actually. Solomon messed up, and God said, you know what? Under the reign of your son, I'm going to divide the kingdom in, in two parts, and Jeroboam is going to get ten parts. And, uh, and so it was kind of a punishment to, to Solomon. But now we read that ba Baasha comes, and he kills everybody from the house of Jeroboam, uh, just the same way that um, it was said that was going to happen. And so he actually began to reign as a punishment for Jeroboam. And so now he's putting him to death, but he does evil as well. And so he has a son that reigns. And then Zimri, Zimri oh, that's where you. I saw somebody shake their head. I thought it was just because it, it, was, it was ugly looking. Zimri, um, comes in and he overthrows Elah and puts to death all of Baasha. So he, his reign, in a manner of speaking, is a punishment for the sins of, of Baasha. So it just keeps repeating. And you see it kind of skips a generation, but that's just kind of how it works. The new king comes and then that's a perfect opportunity for the other king to rise up and and the kingdom's weak and all this stuff. Well, Elah only reigns two years. Zimri overthrows him. He's like his captain. He leads like half his chariots. And, uh, and so he overthrows him. And when Israel finds out he overthrows him, they put Omri in his stead after only seven days. And so very short reigns. But what we're seeing, though, still is how this is just a continuation of basically history repeating itself. And, uh, and this is a, a situation that we find all throughout society. Now, whether it is our government, this is the big one, right? We see that policies and things that people are trying, they might not be exactly same, the same, but they sure rhyme well. <laughs> They're going over and over. It's like, haven't we seen this before? Didn't another president try this or another a group of people try to put this into order? You know, every time there's a, a, you know, a mass, uh, you know, 
stimulus bills and stuff like that, and there's a mass amount of money that's being given out. Huh, scratch your head and think, like, what happened last time we tried this? The economy suffers, right? And everybody's like, no, 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 it's not going to happen this time. Well, then it suffered, and then the people that wanted it said, like, that's not the reason it's suffering. And all we know is we're just looking at history saying, well, that's what they said last time it happened after they said it wasn't going to happen, and then it did happen. And then, you know what, the next president's going to come in, he'll do something similar whenever times are rough and make promises to the people, and then it's just going to, it's just history repeating itself. Nobody seems to learn from that. And I'm not a president, not running for president or any office anytime soon, so, uh, you know, I'm just giving you my two cents, but it sure seems like people keep repeating the same things over and over, and they're not working. You know, when COVID came, that was a huge deal. Everybody said, unprecedented. Like, this, you know, like it's something that's never happened before. And then uh, when the policies were called into question, they said, well, you know, back in such and such, we had, we had uh, the, the swine flu or we had the Spanish flu or we had whatever. Oh, so you're saying this has happened before. So it's not unprecedented, <laughs> you know. These things have happened. Well, let's go back into history and look how some of these things were put into place and some of these things happened. And guess what? You find a lot of repetition, a lot of things going over just the same way that they went before. And so it's no surprise that we're going to see uh, cycles repeating and, uh, and history repeating itself. We see it in churches and movements of people who are serving the Lord doing the best they can, they're so winning, they're trying to be a light for the world, I mean, you know, to the world uh, for Jesus Christ. And, and throughout history, there's certain things that happen. They get comfortable, they begin putting a lot of focus into the building, into the programs and all this kind of stuff. Then they lose sight of what they're supposed to be doing. And then there's corruption that comes in and there's all these kinds of things. And then they have to kind of start over and get a new stretch. And you could see... Many times in many movements and many uh, churches uh, that have been around for a long time, it's just repeated cycles, and they just keep repeating itself over and over, and this isn't something that should surprise us. The Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun in Ecclesiastes 1.9. Let's go ahead and go there. Ecclesiastes 1.9. He says, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Now, Solomon was kind of depressed about the way things were going. Everything's vanity and vexation of spirit. And he began to look at all the cycles. And he says, you know what? It's already been done before. Somebody comes up with this new idea. Hey, somebody's tried something like it before. A uh, new policy. Somebody's tried something like it before, you know, a new idea somebody has. This is all, there's nothing new under the sun. And, you know, if there's nothing new under the sun, the Bible also says, uh, God says in uh, Malachi chapter 3, you don't have to go there, but he says, I change not. And Jesus says he's the same today, uh, yesterday, today, and forever. Okay, so uh, if God doesn't change, and if nothing seems to be changing on this, on this earth, you know, because people keep on making the same mistakes over and over, maybe it's because God never changes and he keeps punishing for the same things that people keep doing over and over. And so you got Solomon and he, you got Saul. I mean, he was a bad one too. And you got Solomon and he punishes him. And then Jeroboam walks in some of the same ways. And Jeroboam gets punished. And then Baasha gets punished. And Zimra gets punished. All the other ones did too. But the thing is, you know, they keep, the things that they keep doing are contrary to what God wants and what God ordains. And so, therefore, God, who never changes, is going to punish, continue to punish those things that the people haven't changed. Now, I want to ask, uh, uh, think about this and ask a few questions here. Why don't we learn from our parents' mistakes, for instance? Because, you know what, there's a, lot of pe- people, there's a lot of people who become alcoholics, for example, whose parents are alcoholics or drug addicts because their parents were drug addicts or, or something like that. 
And, you know, you would think a person would see their parents go through that and say, well, I don't ever want to live that. And occasionally it happens that way. But most of the time, they end up going back and doing the same sins that their, their, their parents did. And, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you can't help it. It's in your DNA and all this kind of stuff. Well, I, I don't believe that. I think that anybody can stand up, and I'll show that here in a minute. They stand up and do what's right, even though everything they've seen from their parents was wrong. Okay? Uh, there are cases where a father is an abusive father, abusive husband, and the child grows up in that, and he's just like, I don't ever want to be like my dad. And then as soon as he gets married, all of a sudden he becomes just an abusive guy. And you can call it hereditary, you can call it uh, what you want, but the reality is a sin. And if somebody's going to sin, it's always contrary to what God wants, and God's going to punish that, and, and, uh, and this keeps going over and over. But why don't we learn from our parents? Why doesn't the United States uh, citizens learn that, hey, if we put a certain type of person in office, this is going to happen. If we do this, if we try to go... For these rights, God's going to get mad at us, and he's going to punish us. And why, you know, why don't, don't we learn that? Why don't pastors and, and churches learn that, A, if we go this direction, it's never worked for any church before, or any movement before, and actually staying true to the Lord. And so why would we want to keep going that way? But why don't we learn from that? And I want us to give you three reasons why I believe we don't learn from history. Number one, basically, here's the easy answer. The, the first one is pretty easy. It's simply that we don't get it. We don't get the message that God's trying to send. We don't get the, uh, the, the reality, the lesson that God's trying to teach us. We just don't get it, right? And most of the time, I would, I would say it's not just that we're not capable. We don't recognize it, don't understand it, or we're not capable of understanding what God's trying to show us. It's this. We're willingly ignorant. We're willingly ignorant. It's just like, you know, well, I think it'll be okay. And, uh, and, or, and, or maybe we just don't want to study history. Or maybe we don't want to think about what the Bible says. Or uh, that something that happened to the society might have been God punishing society because of this. Uh, or to our churches or whatever. Maybe it's just that we didn't get the lesson. A long time ago, um, I think about this uh, a lot. I don't know that... Anybody else remembered it, but I have remembered it. Um, one of the first messages I preached uh, was, uh, you can learn a lot from a dummy. And the whole purpose of that message was to show, uh, you know, or I was talking about the life of David. And David, you know, he really messed up with the women. And he, uh, you know, had multiple wives and had bad relationships with all the wives. And, and no doubt was telling his son, hey, when you become king, you know, don't let the women... You know, mess you up. And so what happens? Solomon, he comes and he loves many strange women and they, and they change his heart towards, uh, away from the Lord. And so no, it's not saying women are bad or marriage is bad. I'm just saying he was saying watch out for the wrong women and watch out for going after many women and lusting and having all this. And Solomon fell in his father's footsteps. Now, I don't know about Jeroboam, because we read about all other kinds of sins he did. I know he had multiple wives. Uh, but I know all through Proverbs, Solomon is saying, my son, listen to my instruction. <laughs> my son, my son. And everything is about, like, watch out that you don't do that. And he's constantly talking about the wrong kind of women and constantly talking about all types of things that Jeroboam, clear, I mean, Rehoboam, clearly didn't follow um, whenever he told him that. And so it's just the, the reality that, that we tend to not get the message. You know, I don't know how many, I, I've probably shared this before, but uh, I remember when I started working at UPS, I'm a strong, I was a strong kid, you know, I, I could lift a lot of stuff. And so, you know, I'm saving some time by going out there. They said you need two people to lift these heavy packages and the irregular packages that come through the train and uh, to save time. I didn't want to call anyone out of the trailer to come help me lift these. So all night long, I'd be lifting these heavy packages and putting them up on the grates and say, hey, get these in there, and, uh, and I'd throw them up there. And these older men would be walking by, and they'd be like, you know, you, you shouldn't do that. And I'm thinking, oh, come on, it saves a lot of time. They're like, no, 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 you shouldn't do that because you're going to get a hernia. And I was like, ah, I'm strong, I'm lifting right, I know what I'm doing. Well, I got a hernia that 
I can trace all the way back to that time when I worked at UPS. I never had it like really checked out, but <laughs> I know that that's happened, and I know that where it came from. And uh, and so I should have listened to them. You know, I remember in uh, school, every adult said, "You know what? You ought to really do is pay close attention in school and get good grades and study and do all these kinds of things and learn the math and learn the this and learn the that." And I'm like, well, "I know, I know, I know, but I really don't like school and." And, you know, I do have some things I can fall back on, like my wonderful uh, uh, ability at baseball. Yeah, that really went far. <laughs> I got some things to fall back on, like my art. You know, I can go be an artist. Yeah, starving artist, right? And so, like, here I am. You know, I started, I got into my 30s, and now I'm in my 40s, and it's, I'm telling my kids, well, you know, well, while you're young, you ought to really start doing the school and paying attention and, and, and studying so that when you're older, you know, you'll have these, uh, you'll, you'll have, I love learning now, and I love studying and research, but it's just like, man, I wish I would have got this the first time. It saved me a lot of time and effort and understanding. I still don't like math, but, <laughs> but, you know, the point is, here's what happens, though. We're young, and we say, like, well, I understand what you're saying, and it is true, but you know what? I'll just have to figure it out for myself. That's just the way, you know. And so we're willingly ignorant, and we decide that we want to uh, learn it for ourselves. Now, sometimes it's not just, uh, you know, willingly ignorant. Sometimes we just literally think that we are better than our parents, or we're better than the last generation or whatever. And that's naturally within us because we tend to think, well, they might not have been able to handle it, but I can handle it. And uh, most people wouldn't verbalize that, say it out loud, uh, but there's a lot of times where we think that we could do things that all those before us were incapable of doing. And you know what's bad is that our society actually encourages that. Our society is just kind of like, man, you're strong, believe in yourself, you can do whatever you want to do. And, you know, we eat up these stories about some kid who was living on the streets and then he found out how to play basketball and so he began to train, he began to do that, and now he's a superstar basketball player making millions and millions. And so now every little kid's like, you know what, when I grow up, I'm going to be a professional basketball player. And everyone's like, well, you just keep on doing the work and you keep on going, you just follow your dreams. Don't let anybody stop you, don't let anybody. And then they put movies out where somebody does something like that, and their parents and everybody are like, no, you know, that's not wise, and if you're going to be a real man, then you need to support your family and go get a job, and you need to deal with this. And they're like, they're like, yeah, but you don't understand. Like, I, I can't help it. I just got to play basketball or whatever sport it is. And in the movie, it always works for them. We're watching the movies where these guys always become the, the famous uh, athletes and the, and the fam famous movie stars and all this. And so society just... We feed on that. Society gives it to us. And we're just like, yeah, you know what? We can do whatever we want to do. And nobody can stop us. And you know what? Everybody thought that before us. And it didn't work out so well for them. You say, well, what about this story or that story? The exception proves the rule. Very rarely does it happen. But the reality is there are certain principles that you can live your life by. And you can say, hey, God said, if I do this, he's going to take care of me. He's going to bless me. And, uh, and so many times we think, yeah, yeah, but I'm better than the other generation. I can handle it. Nobody else can handle it, but I can handle it because I believe in myself. Well, you need to believe in the Lord and you need to believe in the Word you know, because yourself, your heart is desperately wicked and it's not going to lust for the right things, okay? So number three, why don't we learn our lesson? And here's just the harsh reality of it. We are all made of the same stuff. <laughs> From Adam, and Cain, and you know, all the people of, uh, uh, until now, you know, you say, how did that Bible character go get so off and make so many mistakes? Well, because he is made out of the same thing his father was made out of. Now, how could all these people, you know, not see? How could those Israelites that we talk about on Sunday morning, how could they, how could they murmur and complain to Moses? Because they were made of the same stuff that their fathers were, you know, whenever they ended up in the land of Egypt. Well, how could so-and-so have treated his family so bad? Uh, doesn't he know that God's not going to like that? Well, he's made of the same stuff that his father, you know, 
This is the reality of it. Now, God's not surprised by this. Let's look at a couple of verses. Look at Psalm 103. God knows who he is, and God knows who we are. And he, I believe he gets frustrated with us sometimes. Now, he doesn't sin. <laughs> but I believe he sees our, our uh, foolishness, and he knows that he needs to chasten that and get that out of us, or he needs to punish that because it's wicked or whatever. But God is not surprised about our limitations and our failures. Look at Psalm 103, verse 14. For he knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. He made us out of dust, people. <laughs> you know, we're, we're lucky that he gave us breath and he gave us a brain and all that. But really, in God's eyes, we're just dust. The Bible says our righteousnesses, the good works that we would do and try to present to God, it's like filthy rags in God's eyes. He sees that and says, you know what, it's not really that impressive. <laughs> Now, he'll reward us for the works that we do for Christ and uh, for his children and all that stuff. But in reality, he knows our frailties. He knows when this earth was cursed that we were, we're in cursed bodies as well. And we're in a corrupted, fallen uh, state. And this is why, like this morning, I talked about he's just so patient. He's so long-suffering. Now, he has his times where he certainly has to punish and take care of business and, and chasten and all that. But God is such a loving God. And he must be patient for us to just constantly be repeating history, repeating history, and seeing all these things happen. And this is such a great example as we see uh, the reality of these kings just falling and falling and falling. Look at Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. And essentially it's 120 years before the flood comes. And so God's like, you know what? I'm not going to just continue to strive with man. His days are numbered. He's flesh, and, uh, and, and, and his time is coming. He ends up uh, after... the flooding the world, he ends up giving a, a rainbow as a sign that he's not going to destroy the, uh, the world by flood again. And he makes a similar statement about how, you know, hey, they're just a bunch of dumb sheep. You know, they're just dust. That's even less than sheep. They're just, uh, uh, you know, they're not much to work with, but they're my people, and I created them, and I love them. And so, uh, uh, so this is not a surprise to God. So what am I saying? Am I, am I giving the license to just say, you know what? You're going to commit the same mistakes your father did. Go ahead and do it. You know, you're going to destroy your life. You're going to mess it up. God's going to punish you. Just go ahead and do it. You're just human. You're just dust. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that's why we repeat history. That's why we don't learn from our mistakes. That's why we mess up. But I'm not saying at all that it can't be done right because here's an example right here. He reigns 41 years and does quite well. Now, he's at war with these guys. Every single one of these guys are at war with him during his reign. But here he is. These guys have ten tribes of Israel. And here he is in, in Judah with two tribes. And, uh, uh, and, he's, and he's, you know, he's ruling and reigning. He makes a couple mistakes. He doesn't get rid of the, some of the worship in the high places. He lets that go. But he's got a heart towards the Lord, and he gets the sodomites out of the land. Guess what? The sodomites in the land is something that history repeats itself. From the beginning, you know, from the days of Lot, probably before that, probably in the days of, Genesis, uh, of, uh, of Noah uh, as well. And history just repeats itself. Every time the world starts giving favor to them and starts letting the sodomites just have their liberties and their freedoms, things get really messed up and God gets mad. And so you get kings every once in a while that come in and say, you know what, we're going to get rid of that. And we're going to follow the Lord. We're going to tear down the idols. We're going to cut off the relationships with people that are causing our, our society to sin, and to, uh, our community to sin. And so he said, I'm going to do right with the Lord. And God said, hey, he was a good man. He was perfect, and he had a pure heart, and he's like his father David. 
all these guys are compared to Jeroboam, and, all, and they're all sinful. They're all wrong. Now, obviously, nobody's perfect. We're all with some sin. But Asa was somebody who had a right heart, and he served the Lord, and the Lord allowed him to have a long reign, to accomplish a lot of things, and to be a light and a lamp, the Bible says, uh, to the people. And so it can be done. It can be done. And unfortunately, there's only small remnants throughout history of people who said, you know what, we're not going to go the way that everybody else is going. We're not going to follow this trend because we know better. We know that this is going to destroy society or this is going to destroy our churches or this is going to destroy our families. And we know that because the Bible says that. And I'm going to follow the Lord and I'm not going to fall into this whole history repeating itself. So as a whole, mankind is going to repeat history. Mankind is going to not learn from their mistakes. They're not going to learn the lessons. Uh, you know, we're all made of the same stuff. But a person who walks in the Spirit and says, God, I need your help. God, I want to know what your word says. God, I want to refrain from things that are going to destroy my family and destroy my church. God, I want you to help me to do this. God can bless your reign, quote, unquote. He can bless and give you a long, prosperous reign and, uh, and allow, him, allow you to do many wonderful things uh, for the Lord. And uh, that's what, of course, I'm praying for. That's what I hope that all of us will try to do, not follow in the mistakes of past generations, of past people. It can be done. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your uh, word once again. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to be faithful to your word and follow it and serve you with the pure heart, the, most, the best of our ability. We know that we're dust, Lord. We know that we're frail and we are capable of committing all the sins of generations before us and our parents and, and, uh, and previous uh, leaders and, and all. We, we understand we're capable. We understand our, our failures. But we know who you are, Lord. And we know that you're a perfect God and a righteous God. And, and, uh, and, and we seek you. We ask for your wisdom. And I pray, Lord, that you just keep us from falling, keep us from... Uh, uh, destroying ourselves and help us to be fruitful uh, for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray.